The American News this time focuses on existing chemicals for which several changes can be seen on the horizon. Our Tosca news anchor for this chem connection is David Fischer, former EPA deputy administrator for the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution. David now works for Keller and Heckman in Washington. David, great to have you with us. With the new Biden administration, what is the current state of risk evaluation of existing chemicals within EPA? Great question. I don't really know the answer, but perhaps the negotiators thought they were in agreement five years ago in 2016 when Tosca was amended, only to find out that their recollections had changed over those five years. And we now find ourselves in a situation where there is, without a doubt, a fundamental disagreements as to exactly how Tosca was intended to be implemented. Even after five years, we are still in that situation. And we'll see how things unfold over the next, certainly the next several months, next year or so, to understand perhaps how Tosca really is to be implemented. We'll have court opinions being issued. We'll have a much better sense of what EPA intends to do vis-a-vis -vis Tosca impl implementation. But for the moment, we don't absolutely know how Tosca was intended to be implemented because there was disagreement, as I, as I mentioned. The Tosca amendments are five years old, but it seems as if the fundamental pieces are still in flux. Why is that? It's certainly in flux because the principal deputy assistant administrator for the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, soon to be the assistant administrator herself, Dr. Michal Friedhoff has made it very clear that EPA is reconsidering a number of the sub substantive and key policy decisions that were made in the prior administration. And those policy reconsiderations will require further analysis, perhaps in each of the 10 risk evaluations that have been finalized to date. But meanwhile, the risk management rules uh, that their development at least are continuing. So we have flux in exactly how the risk evaluations are to be carried out, even though they're now final. EPA has, has made it very clear that they will be going back to make some recon to reconsider some of the issues that were decided in the prior administration. At the same time, the risk management rules are underway to address the risks that were identified in the final risk evaluations for the initial 10. So it may sound a little bit confusing. So we have a lot of things going on all at the same time. What was very clear was that Dr. Friedhoff did not want to hold up the promulgation of those risk management rules. So those are continuing Meanwhile, some reanalysis and reassessment of some of the considerations that were made in the prior administration are underway now, and they may result in changes to the risk evaluation and subsequently risk management. So we'll have to wait to see. What changes are expected to the way which EPA conducts risk evaluations? At least three changes that EPA has telegraphed to the stakeholders at large that it intends to take a hard look at. And the three are the following. Let's start off with one of the largest and most significant changes that EPA intends to make or has suggested that it plans on making this. It hasn't made it yet. And that, that involves whether or not the unreasonable risk determination is per condition of use or for the particular chemical undergoing risk evaluation. So there would be a binary determination. Either the chemical is or does or does not present unreasonable risk, period. We don't make a determination based on conditions of use. So unlike the 10 risk evaluations that were finalized, you won't see going forward at least uh, the risk evaluation having a litany of conditions of use that either pose unreasonable risk or do not. Going forward, 
the, the unreasonable risk determination will be focused just on the particular chemical. Now, that doesn't mean the conditions of use won't be part of the risk evaluation. They certainly will be. That's absolutely clear in the statute. So the challenge for the EPA at this juncture is, well, what about the current 10 final risk evaluations? What will EPA do for them? We, they are already based on conditions of use. So the risk management rules are for the conditions of use that were deemed to pose an unreasonable risk. It's a little unclear at this point exactly how all that will un unfold if EPA makes a determination that, that Congress had always intended a binary determination on the chemical itself, not on the conditions of use. So that's still in flux but a very, very important consideration for folks to follow. Two others really quickly. EPA has also made it clear that it believes that the 10 final risk evaluations didn't look at fence line subpopulations that may be more exposed than the general population. So they would be considered a potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulation, a PESS. None of the 10 looked at fence line communities that are outside of a manufacturing facility, for example. Manufacturing facility making the chemical, that's the subject of the risk evaluation. Dr. Mayol Friedhoff has indicated that those risk evaluations should have looked at that subpopulation. That also indicates that EPA is going to take a harder look at this concept of regulatory nexus. The reason why the prior administration did not look at fence line communities is because, at least from air exposures, and that's where Dr. Friedhoff, Friedhoff has indicated she wants to focus on, air emissions, air exposures to fence line, fence line communities. The reason why we did not look at that when I was the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention is under the Reg Nexus approach, EPA at that time believed TSCA was a gap-filling statute. There are lots of other statutes that deal with other environmental media, and those are the, the domain of other program offices, like the Air Office or the Office of Water, Office of Land and Emergency Response, for example. There are other offices within EPA that look at, look at and control and manage exposures from chemicals through other pathways that EPA opted not to include in the risk evaluations that have been finalized to date. So that air exposure pathway from that facility to the fence line was carved out of the risk evaluations because at that time we deemed it an area that was being addressed through the air program under the Clean Air Act. That supposition that consideration is now under review by EPA. So there are at least three areas of, of uh, review that are ongoing by the current Biden administration. And we'll see how all that plays out. It's going to take some time for all that to be settled out. But those, those are three areas that stakeholders need to keep an eye on very closely. How impactful to industry do you think these changes will be? Without a doubt, and I've, as I probably alluded to in the answer to the prior question, the changes that are underway are going to be significantly impactful to industry. If, in fact, EPA, for example, takes a much different view of the concept of regulatory nexus and, in fact, brings into risk evaluations exposure pathways that in the prior administration were scoped out of the risk evaluation, now, all of a sudden, the authority of TSCA will bleed into the authorities of other statutes and other programs within EPA. And how exactly EPA will craft a risk management rule to, for example, deal with an air exposure issue from a particular facility that might be leading to unreasonable risk for a subpopulation at the fence line remains to be seen. Will it work with the air office to promulgate that rule? Will the air office promulgate that rule or, or assist 
EP, the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention in promulgating that rule? What exactly will that rule look like? And how would be it be reconciled with, for example, the permitting process for that facility? So that's another reason why the prior administration opted to scope out some of those exposure pathways because we believe they were best dealt with through other programs under other statutes. All this is to say, these are significant changes that will be definitely impactful to industry and bear a very close eye on as things become a little more settled and less in flux over the next months and years. The amended Tosca allows a manufacturer to request a risk evaluation for a manufacturer's chemical. Is this something you would recommend manufacturers to do? So in a word, I, I would have to say no. I, I really don't see any benefit of using that provision of Tosca for industry. It had been used and has been used to date by a handful of, of companies, but that was all done in the prior administration, none of which have been finalized, by the way. So all those risk evaluations are still underway and presumably will be impacted by those changes that are coming down the pike that I chatted about earlier, right? Those won't be immune to the changes that are happening to the risk evaluation process now. Those will impact the manufacturing requested risk evaluations. So I honestly don't see that vehicle as of benefit to industry. That's not to say, however, that industry should not be proactive. Under amended TOSCA, there are many opportunities for the industry to be proactive long before your chemical might be chosen as a and designated as a high priority chemical and therefore subject to risk evaluation. There are many things that industry can do. And it's certainly something that I've been advocating in, in, in really every job I've had over the last several years since TOSCA was amended whether I was at the American Chemistry Council, a deputy assistant administrator at, at EPA, or now as counsel for the law firm of Keller and Heckman. I'm very much a believer and promoter of proactive activities, engagement by industry with EPA, with other stakeholders. There's always something that can be done long before your chemical is prioritized. At Chemical the Americas in Philadelphia, I discussed with Alex Dunn the key lessons learned and experiences with the risk evaluations for the first 10 priority substances. When do you expect that EPA can completely finish the risk management measures for these first 10 substances? That's an excellent question, and the answer to, to which is, is unclear. The statute, however, is clear in requiring EPA to promulgate a proposed rule within a year of the final risk evaluation being issued and then finalize that proposed rule within another year. So a total of two years. So once the risk evaluation is completed and issued as final, the clock starts and the, that two year time period starts to winnow down. And that is happening for all 10 risk evaluations. So we are well within that two year time frame. The months are passing. So let, let me use another the same term I've been using before. It's in flux. The timeline is a bit in flux, even though the statute is very clear that a final risk management rule is to be issued two years after the risk evaluation is finalized. And as we know, all 10 risk evaluations are final and have been finalized some several months ago. So EPA's timeline continues to shrink with each passing month. And in light of those reconsiderations that I mentioned earlier, uh, those reconsiderations, if they impact the risk evaluations that have been finalized, they will in turn presumably impact the risk management rules that are underway. So I think a couple things will happen. I believe EPA will probably miss the two year deadline. And it may in fact, issue risk management rules for 
a given chemical in in more than one segment, more than one part. So you may get a risk management rule that deals with certain risks, and then that risk management rule might be supplemented based on the reconsiderations that were that are are underway for some of the final risk evaluations. So you might get again a final risk of that risk management rule dealing with a number of the exposure pathways, for example, uh, or worker exposure issues, for example, that might be finalized and then be supplemented by an, another rule that deals with the exposures that were reevaluated or reconsidered that were not scoped in when those risk evaluations were being developed, but are now scoped in in light of the decisions made by the Biden administration. So I think we'll miss the deadline. I don't know by how much. And there may be supplemental risk management rules issued. EPA has not said that per se, but that, that could happen. So uh, an important uh, metric to watch for is when exactly does EPA issue the proposed rules? Again, that's supposed to be within a year. So if EPA misses that by so many months, it will in turn miss that two-year deadline by as many months, without a doubt. So we'll have to see what happens over the next six months or so. Uh, recall that methylene chloride risk evaluation was the first risk evaluation to be issued, and that was issued within the three and a half year time frame for issuing a risk evaluation. So we'll see what that risk management rule looks like and when when that is issued as a proposed rule. So time will tell. David, thank you very much for your information. I'm sure we hear more about this at ChemCon Europe in London. I look forward to seeing you there.